This is um, Dr. Donald Danino, and I'm going to be discussing today transoral robotic uh, surgery um, for head and neck cancer of the oral pharynx. Um, to start with uh, a little bit of the background of head and neck cancer uh, uh, will be presented. Um, it's the sixth most common cancer which is encountered in the United States with uh, 40,000 new cases diagnosed every year. When you look at a worldwide um, occurrence, it's 500,000 cases a year. And the statistically, in the past, it's the greatest risk factors have always been tobacco and alcohol use. However, in the recent past few decades, we've seen a, a real endemic and a real explosion of cancer in related to human papilloma uh, virus. Um, most of what I'm going to discuss today applies more to the HPV or the human papilloma related uh, cancers. As I said, it's an epidemic which is occurring, which we're just starting to realize now. What we've seen is cancers involving the tonsil, the back of the, of the tongue, the back of the throat between 1973 and, 19, and 2004 have increased 1.3% uh, per year. Whereas those cancers which are not associated with the virus and associated at this point still with tobacco and alcohol use have actually been decreasing. And as an example of that, you can see the oral cavity has decreased uh, almost 2% per year over that same um, time period. Um, and looking further at the tumor which we removed back, in, uh, extending back to 1973 in the United States, you can do staining on archival tissue, a tissue that's already been removed. And at that point in the early 1970s, 18% of the uh, tumors involving the oral pharynx have been, were HPV positive. In 2004, it's now been up to three quarters or 73% of the tumors are HPV positive, and, and there's even further indication that that uh, rate has even increased since then. When we look at other Western uh, countries, and Sweden has a very good database um, to observe this, they had very similar findings in the 1970s. It was about 20, in the low 20 percent. And then 2007, some more recent data has actually shown that uh, almost uh, more than nine out of every 10 cancers which they diagnose is HPV related in the oral pharynx. This picture which we see here shows uh, the tongue in the midline and the tonsils on the left and right with the left tonsil which is a tonsil on the right-hand side of the screen being larger than the left uh, and having a tumor within it. So as we look at HPV and this epidemic, what we see is similar to GYN, um, cancers that certain subtypes or phenotypes of the HPV virus are more related uh, to forming cancer with uh, HPV subtype 16 by far the most common with up to 90% of all the HPV-related cancers, do you find the phenotype 16 involved within it? For patients who have a known human papillomavirus oral infection, their risk of cancer is 50 times greater than that of the general population. What we have seen with this epidemic of HPV-related cancer is that the patient population itself is changing significantly. The epidemiology is changing. Instead of patients when it, uh, who were um, males, who were elderly, uh, and with significant tobacco and alcohol use, we're now seeing it occur in, still in males, but in young, well-educated males that are usually in their uh, 40s and 50s. Um, and this graph that's on the side on the picture here, what we're seeing is the, the gold color is the overall incidence of pharyngeal cancer is slowly increasing. And if you compare it to the darker uh, line, which is HPV negative cancer decreasing, that related to smoking and drinking, as it's become more well known and accepted that smoking is a risk factor, is decreasing, whereas that related to the virus, which is in the light blue line, has uh, significantly increased over the last few decades. So um, HPV related oral cancer um, as stated before, is undergoing. A, a, we're seeing a shift in the patient population. It's now in younger, predominantly white males, usually in their 40s and 50s. They have a very high socioeconomic status. They're well educated. Um, they function at a high level. They do. They do have a history of, of increased uh, lifetime sexual partners, with the greatest risk being more than five uh, sexual partners over a lifetime. What we are finding also, which is different from uh, cancer, which previously was um, 
related to smoking and drinking is at the primary site to the site where the cancer arises, such as the tonsil, the base of the tongue is very small. There on the right hand side of the picture, we see a PET CT with the CT portion on the left and the PET portion on the right. The top arrow on the uh, the CT portion, so the image on the left, shows a very small bump by the base of the tongue, which is the cancer, which you can see increased uptake or the white area on the PET scan to the right. The lymph node is the rounded area with the second arrow to it on the CT scan with, again, the, the increased uptake on the right. So we're finding these patients are very small primaries with extensive lymph nodes where the previous uh, smoking and drinking patients had very large primaries or very large uh, cancer in their tonsil or the base of the tongue with very small uh, lymph nodes. So this is changing. So as this uh, epidemiology has changing and as there's a rapid epi uh, epidemic arising in HPV-related cancer, we've now started to relook at all our treatment for this type of cancer. When you go back prior to the 1990s, the main treatment had been surgery with radiation. However, starting in the early 90s, there has been an attempt to try and minimize side effects and perform and have organ preservation. And most of this work has come from the uh, examining laryngeal cancers. And what's happened is that chemotherapy and radiation have become the forefront of treatment because to access these cancers and to remove it involves very aggressive, highly morbid surgery. And surgical salvage has been only used um, for failures from chemotherapy and radiation. Um, however, what we have found, despite preserving these organs, preserving the tonsils, the base of the tongue, the larynx, these patients still do not always have improved function. Most of these patients after chemoradiotherapy have significant dysphagia, which is difficulty swallowing. Up to 30% or a third of the patients will have a feeding tube or remain G-tube dependent. The radiation causes fibrosis, particularly within the muscles that help you swallow and result in poor movement of the larynx and swallowing, um, as well as an increased risk of esophageal stricture or a narrowing in the esophagus resulting in difficulties swallowing. So because of these um, concerns, the poor functioning, the younger patients, the patients actually have fewer comorbidities. They don't have as great other medical problems related to their significant smoking or drinking. These patients function at a better level because they're younger. They usually have young children. They're usually functioning in a high-level job that we wanted to try and things to improve their quality of life. Because of this, it's been investigated, the use of the robot, because it offers the advantage of avoiding external incisions. It's all done through the mouth, and it avoids the need to split open the jaw to get access to the region in the back of the throat and the mouth. The hospital stay compared to conventional surgery is markedly reduced from anywhere up to uh, 10 days down to as little as one to three days. And it avoids the need for an extensive reconstruction, restructive procedure where we take tissue from another part of the body to replace that was, which was removed. This was done previously uh, with extensive surgery because you obviously created a communication from under the skin and the neck to in the mouth, and at this point, when we do this separately, we do not have that connection. So what it entails is the robot is used. This is a picture. The, what we can see is the robot in position. There's an assistant who sits at the head whose hands you see. We see the three arms of the robot. The center arm is the camera, which gives 3D uh, visualization, and then the two arms on the side can be interchangeable with different instruments to help you do it. Um, so there's no external incisions, and all the, the approach is done through the uh, mouth. When you cannot use the robot is if the patient cannot open their mouth wide or they have a very small mouth. At this point, there's no way to cut through bone with the robot. So if the mandible, the bone of the mandible is involved, we can't do it. If more than half the tongue base is involved, the concern is that you'd have to remove so much of the base of the tongue that the remaining tongue, the vascularity to it would be uh, compromised. And that's the same for a tonsil cancer, which is fixed, fixed and it, you can't move. The concern is that it would be uh, attached to the uh, internal carotid artery, which cannot be resected. And that's what the bottom uh, thing as well. If it's attached to the common internal carotid artery, either the primary or the neck disease, and it, you can't separate it from it, it's a contraindication to surgery.
the onset of TORS, it's been compared to open surgery. What is seen is that the length of stay within the hospital is dramatically reduced with uh, TORS procedures, where it's decreased from uh, a little over a week for the open surgery to uh, anywhere from three to four days, uh, anywhere from one to four days, but closer to three to four days for the TORS. Also, the need for a tracheotomy at the time of the procedure has markedly decreased uh, the initial uh, experience with TORS resulted in approximately uh, one, just under one-fourth of the patients requiring tracheotomies as opposed to up to almost 80% for the open surgery, though even that now it's more the exception to do a tracheotomy for TORS, uh, so the majority of patients actually do not get tracheotomy tubes. These patients also do better from a eating and feeding point of view in that the need for a persistent feeding tube has dropped from 30% after open surgery to 3% with TORS, and the patients also experience significantly less uh, blood loss since so much less tissue is actually uh, manipulated through the surgery. So comparing it just open surgery, it's much less chance of having uh, poor healing from the mandible since you don't have to split it open. There's no hardware that needs to be placed to hold the mandible in position, and there's no, uh, you don't need complicated reconstructions uh, following the surgery. Um, at this point, uh, TORS uh, is indicated for small tumors, tumors that are less than uh, four centimeters in size, tumors that don't have extensive uh, lymph node involvement. And with that, those features alone, the use of the TORS alone without radiation or chemotherapy results in a greater than 90% cure rate. Um, TORS uh, uh, procedures, uh, people who have cancer of their tonsils, they swallow as well once they've healed from the surgery as they did prior to the surgery. Cancers involving the base of the tongue or the back of the throat uh, have just a slight change after the surgery and have returned back to their baseline by six to nine months. When you compare it directly to chemoradiotherapy, again, um, the need for long-term G2 dependency, meaning greater than six months, drops from 10 to 1%. Quality of life is uh, vastly improved if surgery can be done because surgery allows a de-intensification of the chemotherapy and the radiation. So this video is going to be a transoral robotic resection of a right uh, tonsil cancer in a uh, woman who's previously undergone treatment with chemotherapy and radiation. So here's the tumor uh, in the right tonsillar fossa. That's the anterior tonsillar pillar being uh, pushed on. The uh, forceps was pushing at the base of the tongue. Now the incision is going to be made through the anterior tonsillar pillar. This is done through the pillar, identifying the uh, muscle musculature below it and also through the muscle. This is the incision starting from the area by the tongue, extending up to the soft palate or the roof of the mouth on the right side of the patient. As I said, the dissection goes around the tonsil and through the uh, musculature. This is showing it at a plane as the um, muscular constrictors are being divided um, and removing the tonsil as a whole through what would be called the radical tonsillectomy. The part that's getting divided right now is the mid portion of the tonsil going, uh, extending down towards the, um, at this point, setting up towards the palate or the roof of the mouth. This is where it's getting separated from the roof of the mouth. The structure just to the left of the cutting instrument is the uvula or the part that hangs down. And um, the, when the tumor is removed, it's always removed with a cuff of normal tissue, so we're clearly extending beyond the tonsil for this. Uh, this is uh, just showing a blo the blood vessel, which is a branch going to the tonsil, uh, first getting uh, clamped right here and then divided. That's a close-up picture of the clamps in place. And then the, um, the blood vessel is going to get divided uh, this is done to minimize uh, bleeding and also to prevent uh, post-operative bleeding. This next part shows the lower part of the resection involving uh, the incision going through the base of the tongue. That cut right now is being made through the uh, where the tongue and the tonsil join. So again, a cuff of normal tissue is done going towards that. 
as part of the dissection, the lingual nerve, or the, which is the nerve that gives sensation uh, to the tongue as well as the taste, is being shown just uh, in top of the um, uh, cutting instrument, and it's being separated from it and preserved, um, period. Um, once uh, all those other regions have been adequately cut, this is an incision through the posterior or the back wall of the throat, being and down through the lining of the throat and then down through the musculature, um, which will allow a complete 360 degree um, mobilization of the cancer and removal. And this shows the final cuts which are being done more on the posterior wall and then the delivery of the tumor out. And these are just the final uh, incisions. So as you look at this one thing, you can see the area of resection, uh, it's much larger than actually where the tumor was itself. Once we're done, this is not sutured closed. It's allowed to heal um, on its own. Uh, also visible uh, underneath the number two there is the endotracheal tube of the tube, how the patient is being ventilated during the procedure. Um, so in uh, conclusion, um, we're seeing an epidemic in HPV-related oropharyngeal cancer. We're seeing it happen in younger patients than historically was the case when smoking and drinking were driving the cancer. These patients function at a much higher level. Um, and it's something that we wanted, to, it's an option to allow a vastly improved quality of life afterwards. What has been seen is that it's a safe uh, option for, the, for tumors in this location, it results in a reduced hospital stay and improved quality of life. And at this point, multiple studies are ongoing, but it looks like the use of surgical resection through the TORS uh, will allow de-escalation or decrease the, the need for radiation and chemotherapy and therefore an improved quality of life. Um, thank you.